we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I teach a class at, um, at Southeastern Seminary called Historical Readings in Pastoral Ministry. And I've done the class a couple of times, getting ready to do it again, Lord willing, in January. Uh, and th this talk is the fruit of some of that. And I hope more work that will come out of that. But I want us to look at what the old guys wrote about the pastor's life. There are handouts right on the, the chair right up in the corner uh, as you come in. And I, I've got a few selected quotes out of it that maybe would be helpful and the outline on it. The, the basis of this, very simple, 1 Timothy 4.16. Keep a close, a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Yourself and the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Well, on both sides of the Atlantic in the 18th century, there was a, a legacy of faithful pastors. And, and I'm zeroing in for a moment on Baptist guys, uh, with the exception of Andrew Fuller and John Ryland Jr. Most of these guys didn't write anything uh, or wrote very little. And so we, we kind of put together snippets of them, guys like Robert Hall Sr., uh, John Sutcliffe, uh, Samuel Pierce, and you know, uh, along with Rylan and, and, and Fuller, and William Carey. Uh, they were bound together by gospel ministry, and they were sharpening one another and ended up being uh, a, a mobilized group that was engaged in missionary work. Uh, on the American side, there were guys like Benjamin Miller, Isaac Eaton, Oliver Hart, John Gano, Morgan Edwards, Hezekiah Smith. I don't know if any of these names have crossed your your boundaries, but these were faithful brothers involved in gospel work, but they did not leave us a legacy of writing. Most of that was left to our good Presbyterian and Anglican brothers who were far more prolific writers, uh, but these guys impacted the, the American colonies, and there are churches planted uh, that are still in existence that were planted by these guys during the colonial era. So what do they have in common? Well, one, they were deeply passionate about walking with Jesus. They knew the ministries meant nothing without the preeminence of Christ. Second, they expounded the scriptures to their people. They depended upon the word of God and the power of God, not cleverness, not uh, sophistry. Third, they shared a vision for, for the spread of the gospel, believing that the gospel not their personalities, uh, not their abilities and persuasiveness could change lives. And they were not like those that Paul warned of in 2 Corinthians 2.17, peddlers of God's word. The gospel had affected them, as Paul put it in Ephesians. They had learned Christ. Uh, they gladly bore the reproach of the gospel, and they were like Paul and his gospel partners, Men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So what did they prioritize, even as Paul did? Well, they spoke with sincerity. In other words, they lived under the light of the Spirit's searching gaze and application. Without pretense, with pure motives, they preached the gospel. And they did so as those commissioned by God, literally, but as from God, in the sight of God. They were conscious of living uh, under the divine eye as they labored in ministry. They knew that the Lord would see their mixed motives, that the Lord would see hidden sins and character flaws, and they, they sought to live in His face so that, as Paul put it, we speak in Christ. They understood that their greatest need was not eloquence, it was not clever techniques, it was not admirable uh, responses, it was not the applause of the broader Christian community. They knew uh, that God knew their hearts and they wanted their message to be the message that He had commissioned with no confusion or mixed motives or pretense. There were men of God who were transformed by the same message that they preached and they knew their weaknesses and they felt this desperation. This is one of the things that you see in reading the old guys. They freely talked about their weaknesses. They did not come with 
we got it all together, we've got this figured out, look at our track record, look at all the success we've had. No, they, they came as weak men. And so these old guys, Baptist leaders, Presbyterian, Anglicans, independents, they were following Paul's lead. They kept an eye on maintaining devoted lives for God saw their hearts. And in their gospel commission, they were to bear evidence of having transformed characters as followers of Christ. I, I think sometimes the big struggle with us in, in our day is that we, we have so many books, great books, conferences, uh, media that we can use, a lot of eye candy for the pursuit of ministry success, and we can lean upon crutches for ministry and, and that outward performance and neglect the inward transforming grace of God. We can speak our message. We can speak truth. We can do it in a respectable way and yet have little evidence that that gospel truth has reshaped our lives and is deeply impacting us. This is where previous generations, I, I, I think head and shoulders stand above our generation. Uh, the, these were guys that had this deep consciousness that the pastor's life was far more important than the pastor's work. And so that's what I want us to focus on, that a holy life uh, it means far more than an ad admired ministry. And uh, thankfully, we, we have the voices from, uh, from the past, and more and more books are regularly being cranked out from, from these old guys that we can, can uh, learn from. And so I want us to consider a, a number of guys uh, in, in think under four headings, the pursuit of Christ-likeness, the necessity of holiness as an example for the church, the effect of holiness in our preaching, and the means of suffering to shape character. And then I'll try to draw three applications. One, uh, pastors must pursue Christ-likeness. Uh, probably the first pitfall in ministry is this very first thing, of pursuing Christ-likeness, because ministry can be all-consuming so that it eclipses the foundation of our lives. That which is good eclipses that which is best. And so the old guys stayed focused. And that's why I want us to, to look at the old guys. That's why I've been helped by them so much. Um, Charles Hodge in the 19th century identified what he calls lamentable defective character in pastors. And he pointed out seven areas. Uh, he said, our natural inclinations, our lack of discipline, lack of self-control, educational sophistication, indulging in argumentation and duplicitous talk, unbridled actions or a party spirit, and my favorite during this particular time frame, absorption in politics that divert restraint and indulge in sins under the guise of politics. So how do we address these? Hodge said, Habituate yourselves always to look at the moral character of everything you're called upon to do. Determine always to do what is right regardless of the consequences. Never trifle with your moral feelings. It is trifling with God. Never suffer yourselves to do wrong in little matters, to neglect duties, but be punctual and faithful in all engagements and obligations. And then as we grow in these habits... He shows the consequences. He said, you are now forming your characters and fixing your principles. But if we're careless, he says, if you accustom yourselves now to disregard of duties and violation of engagements in matters which may appear of little importance, you are educating yourselves for more serious departures from rectitude, good faithfulness, right living before the Lord in future life. Such matters cannot be considered little, for if not in, them, in themselves, yet in their influence on character, they are greatly and permanently important. If we fail with character focus, the negative impact is going to explode on us. Uh, the Irish-born 19th century New York Presbyterian Thomas Murphy calls this focus eminent piety. Typical language, see that 18th, 19th century. We just call it personal holiness. He said it should be laid down as our first principle that eminent piety is the indispensable qualification for ministry to the gospel. The pastor should not be satisfied with reaching the general standard of spirituality. 
as a minister appointed to serve in the sanctuary and wait upon souls, how deep should be his humility. And so he's saying that there's no room for neglect. There's no room for taking time off from holiness if we would live in Christ. Murphy says, it is beyond all question that this eminent piety is before everything else in preparation for the duties of the sacred office. And so piety comes first before talents, learning, study, or favorable circumstances, or skill in working, or power in sermonizing. Without this elevated spirituality, nothing else will be of much account in producing a permanent and satisfactory ministry. All else will be like erecting a building without a foundation. Uh, Murphy cites the Scottish pastor Robert Murray McChain, who said, It is not great talents that God blesses so much as great likeness to Christ. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. In the 17th century, Richard Baxter, in his classic work, The Reformed Pastor, said, It is unlikely that people will value the doctrine of such men when they see that they do not live as they preach. All that a preacher says with his actions is a kind of preaching. Patrick Fairburn, a couple of centuries past Baxter, considered pastoral ministry, and I love this phrase, pastoral ministry is a kind of concentrated manifestation of all that had to do with Christianity in the church. And he says, and as the Christianity which should pervade and distinguish the membership of this church is emphatically a life, so the Christian ministry in which it may be said to culminate must be regarded as in the first instance a life and secondarily a work. And then he, he points out that the pastoral epistles you know, lay emphasis on uh, pastoral character far above the pastoral work. And he says, citing Baxter, uh, it is a palpable inconsist uh, inconsistence and grievous mistake in those ministers who study hard to preach exactly, but study little or not at all to live exactly who spend most of the week in studying how to speak two hours and scarcely spend an hour in studying how to live all the week. Well, Spurgeon, with his usual vividness, put it like this. We are, in a certain sense, our own tools and therefore must keep ourselves in order. It will be vain for me to stock my library or organize societies or project schemes if I neglect the culture of myself. For books and agencies and systems are only remotely the instruments of my holy calling. My own spirit, soul, and body are my nearest machinery for sacred service. My spiritual faculties and my inner life are my battle axe, battle axe and weapons of war. Uh, one of the earliest Puritans who was in the 16th and then into the early 17th century William Perkins, in his book, The Art of Prophesying, and he was not off on a charismatic tangency, uh, tangency here, that was just a term he was using for preaching, uh, identifies the divine intention in working deeply and sometimes painfully in us so that we will be useful. He says, if we ever aim to be made instruments of God's glory in saving souls, then at the outset, let us set before our eyes not the honor, but the danger of our calling. He was way ahead of Paul Tripp on that. Um, then he calls for contentment in this work, even when the Lord humbles us. He says, let us be content for God to employ any occasion or means to pull us down, either by outward crosses or inward temptation. And let us rejoice when we are humbled so that we cry out from overwhelmed spirits, as Isaiah did, woe is me, for I am undone. Now, why do we need to be humbled? Well, Perkins answers, otherwise, if we follow the direction of our proud natures and trust in our own abilities, gifts, and learning, we're using carnal weapons in a spiritual warfare. He assured that in this case, the Lord would do no great work in his church by our ministry. Now, we can look upon the outward appearance as Samuel did when he was looking for a replacement for Saul, but the Lord is, it works differently. He weighs the hearts. The character is most important for lasting usefulness. And so Perkins adds with Isaiah 6 in view, 
Some think that if a man has learning degrees and age, he's qualified for this calling. But alas, this is not all that is needed. There is a greater work to be accomplished. He must be humbled and cast down at the sight of the greatness of such a calling, of the majesty of the God on whose behalf he is to minister, and of his own unworthiness for such great work. He, he was aghast at, uh, quote, ministers who venture to preach or minister the holy sacraments without holy and private preparation and sanctification and rush into them as though they were common secular actions. But this exemplary walk that's called for is not hidden in the pasture. And we see this in the second instance. Uh, uh, holiness or piety as an example is essential to the church. John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation in the 14th century, called for pastors to exceed their congregation in attention to holiness, similar to what we heard earlier. There are two things that fall to the office of the shepherd, holiness of life and sound teaching. He, he writes, a pastor should preach the ever fresh truths of God's word to the people, for then he leads his sheep well in good pastures whose nurture will never fade. Because his holiness of life teaches common men by way of clear example, it is essential for this shepherd and his flock that he live in holiness. So preaching isn't enough. He saw holiness as necessary for all that the shepherd did with the flock. Uh, he, he says it is essential for the shepherd and the flock that he live in holiness. To this point, the holy doctors of the church say that the life of the shepherd is a book to the common people and a guiding mark by which they should steer, sort of a visual gospel presented to them. And then he exhorts, thus a pastor ought to exceed his flock in virtues just as the shepherd leads his sheep. For he should be so established in virtue and in the imitation of the chief shepherd that neither covetous nor pride nor fear of death should make him falter. I mean, I wonder, do we feel that way? I mean, Peter tells us, be examples to the flock. Do we look at that and go, yeah, okay. Well, this is why uh, in uh, the late 19th, and early 20th century, Francis James Grimke insisted, it is the truth that, that that example is the truth that vitalizes that is effective. When that which we utter is part of our own lives, is witnessed by our own experience, and we come to realize its value as a life-giving and life-saving force that we can speak of it with authority, with conviction that will at once be recognized. Uh, one of the major leaders of the Reformation, uh, Martin Bucer, uh, who, by the way, mentored John Calvin, uh, in his book Concerning the True Care of Souls, made this critical point. He was explaining that proclaiming the whole word of God is priority for, for the pastor's life. And then he wrote, to do this requires a suitable and noble reputation and a necessary sense of all along with that good example of life which those who exercise the pastoral office are to display to the flock. With evidence of spirituality and divine gifts for ministry, the ministers, Booster continues, must have the greatest respect and confidence of the whole congregation be most thoroughly known for their godly activity and be very skillful and zealous in doctrine, discipline, and everything that promotes salvation, as well as being in the highest measure adorned with all virtues. And then back in the fourth century, the John Chrysostom, the golden tongue expositor at the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, uh, expressed his angst at pastors who did not prioritize holiness. He says, for when he stands up in the congregation and speaks words calculated to make the careless wince, he then stumbles and stops short and is forced to blush at his failure. The good of what he has spoken is immediately wasted. And then he addresses the congregation's response. What does the congregation do when they have an unholy minister? For they who are rebuked, being galled by what has been told them and unable to avenge themselves on him otherwise, taught him with jeers at this ignorance of his, thinking to screen their own reproach thereby. In other words, 
those who, were, who should have been moved by the word deflect their guilt by the lack of holiness and the lack of practicing what he preaches. Uh, pastoral failure at living a holy life, he says, spills over to waste his ministry by providing excuses for the flock and how they live before the Lord. We are those who must give an account for other souls, which means we have to give attention first to our souls. So the third thing we see is true piety affects our preaching. I mean, do we tie that together? Our walk and our preaching. Well, Alexander, or Archibald Alexander, late 18th, early 19th century Presbyterian pastor and theologian makes this connection that preaching is not a job that we do, but an affection we manifest in the pulpit. We're not just doing an oration. We're declaring a life in Christ. And he insists that this holiness of life affects our preparation as well as our proclamation. He says, the true spirit of preaching cannot be described in words, but it can be perceived and felt. Very similar to what Lloyd-Jones writes in Preaching and Preachers. And the spirit is nothing else but the manifestation of those emotions and desires of the heart in which genuine piety consists. And he, he continues explaining that the pastor's affections will be manifested in study and in pulpit. The true remedy and the only remedy against cold, formal, and uninteresting written sermons and against unmeaning and unimpressive extemporaneous harangues is the possession of lively feelings of piety when the minister sits down to compose or when he stands up to speak. And then the striking statement, men of eminent abilities without lively piety make poor and dry preachers. Uh, Thomas Murphy similarly wrote, the real power of the pastor is in his earnest godliness. This is his power with God. It is also his power with men. Uh, this connection with preaching and piety is certainly something that's been known through the ages. And it may be in that statement in Colossians 4, 17, when Paul said, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry which you have received from the Lord. Perhaps there was some of this that was in mind because it literally, he, he was not to slouch in life and doctrine. He was to keep fulfilling it. And so shortly after that letter that Paul wrote, Polycarp in the second century, the pastor and martyr in the Smyrna church, wrote to the Philippian church that Paul founded, expressing his grief over an elder that failed to take seriously the need to be a holy man if he was going to serve the church in word. It seemed that this man by the name of Valens thought good preaching was enough. He says, I'm deeply grieved for Valens, who once was a presbyter among you, this, among this Philippian church, because he so fails to understand the office that was entrusted to him. I warn you, therefore, avoid love of money and be pure and truthful. Avoid every kind of evil. But how can someone who is unable to exercise self-control in these matters preach self-control to anyone else? So in a faithful ministry, preaching in holiness or inseparable. Uh, by the weight of our lives on every word we speak concerning the gospel and the Christian life, we may undo what might have taken years to build and establish with carelessness regarding uh, personal holiness. Uh, Fairburn makes, makes this clear. Uh, he, he talks about the pastor's personal state and behavior and explains, first of all, this personal life is is itself one of the most effective means of teaching. His life is an effective means of teaching. For it is one side of the gospel in living and embodied form, a form which, if sound and true, will, in accordance with the proverb which places example above precept, give forth deeper impressions than what is heard from the lips. And then he, he cites Philip Henry, Matthew Henry's son, in the 17th century, our lives should be the book of the ignorant. Perkins agreed. He said, if ministers are to see any fruit from their ministry, they must first sanctify themselves and cleanse their hearts by repentance before they presume to stand up to rebuke sin in others. Let them not think that their golden words will do as much good as their dead lives will do harm. Spurgeon presses this. He said, once more, <clears throat> 
we must cultivate the highest degree of godliness because our work imperatively requires it. The labor of the Christian ministry is well performed in exact proportion to the vigor of our renewed nature. Our work is only well done when it is well with ourselves. Uh, Lloyd-Jones, the Welshman, pastoring in London, gave attention to this in a sermon. He said, I would lay it down as a first postulate that, that the preacher is always preparing. I mean that literally. That doesn't mean to say that he's always sitting at a desk, but he's always preparing. As it is true to say that there is no such thing as a holiday in the spiritual realm, I always feel that in the same sense, the preacher never has a holiday. The preacher's first and the most important task is to prepare himself, not his sermon. I needed to remember that all these years because sometimes it was that sermon that got my attention more. At first, one tends to think that the greatest thing is to prepare the sermon. And the sermon does need most careful preparation, but altogether more important is the preparation of the preacher himself. And so our preaching is only as effective as the spiritual power that attends it. And that power will, will be there only if we are, as Paul put it to Timothy, a vessel, a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So how does the Lord develop piety in us? Fourth thing, personal piety shaped through suffering. Some things we don't learn well apart from suffering. I mean, think about a kid learning to ride a bike. It's evidence they're learning. They got scrapes on elbows and knees. Uh, think about an athlete that's really achieved. Their soreness, uh, their bruises, there are strains. And the same thing is true in our spiritual lives. If the Lord would purge us and hone us, they're, they're going to be the evidence of suffering in our lives. I mean, think of Hebrews 5.8, speaking of Christ. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. This was the example of our Lord. And we need not think that the Father has a different course for us in training us. Perkins understood this. He wrote, the ministry is a high and excellent calling. A minister is therefore subject to pride and being puffed up with self-conceit. And so we, we mustn't ignore that tendency. And Perkins explains, consequently, Paul warns Timothy that a minister may not be a young scholar lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil, indicating that it is the special danger of ministers to have high opinions of themselves because of the high dignity of their service. It is so insightful. So how does the Lord remove it? Perkins asserts, to prevent this, God in his mercy has planned that all true ministers will, by some means or other, be humbled and emptied themselves. The Lord so values his men that he humbles us. They will be driven to such fear and amazement at the sight of their own wickedness that they will throw themselves down at Christ's feet and deny themselves wholly, acknowledging that anything they are, they are only in him and rely and trust only in his grace and help. Uh, John Newton, the Anglican pastor, uh, in a book of letters that he wrote to the Baptist, who be, uh, man who became a Baptist pastor, John Rollins Jr., in Wise Counsel, uh, the name of the book, uh, mentored Rollins. And so Rollins wrote to Newton complaining of hardships, and so to teach him, Newton talked about some of his own struggles and learning how to rest in God's order of suffering. He said, again, self-righteousness has had a considerable hand in dictating many of my desires for an increase of comfort and spiritual strength. I've wanted some stock of my own. I've been weary of being so perpetually beholden to him, necessitated to come to him always in the same strain as a poor, miserable sinner. Well, he was... He was glad to serve in ministry, but he went on in and confessed that so often he wanted to do ministry on his terms. He said, I could have liked to have done something for myself in ordinary everyday situations and to have depended upon him chiefly upon extraordinary occasions. I found indeed that I could do nothing without his assistance, nor anything even with it, but what I have reason to be ashamed of. If this had only humbled me and led me to rejoice in his all-sufficiency, it would have been well, but it has often been a different effect to make me sullen 
angry and discontented as it was not best and most desirable that he should have all the glory of his own work and I should have nothing to boast of but that in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. I'm now learning the glory only in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me to be content to be nothing that he may be all in all. But I find this a hard lesson. And when I seem to have made some proficiency, I, a slight turn in my spirit throws me back and I have to begin all over again. Ryland was walking through a trial in 1779 and Newton explained, we talk of a cross, but we would have a cross of our own choosing. Suffering gets our attention, but what do we do with it? When it comes, how do we turn it into a divine instrument? Well, he, he writes, comforting Ryland, After all, I trust the Lord will support and carry you through all. These things will humble your spirit and give a mellowness to your preaching. It is these, the, the service, it is in this, or, or the, the, the humbling and the suffering, it is in this way of service that the Lord bestows the tongue of the learned to speak a word in season to weary souls. Later, he tells Ryland about this hand of providence bringing suffering in his own life and how poorly am I a master of it to this hour. What would become of me if the Lord had not stuffed that pillow with thorns on which I was disposed to rest? I think Paul says the same thing more beautifully in 2 Corinthians 4. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. We who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, a few applications. How do, we, how do we really pursue piety as pastors? One, aim at piety, aim at holiness. We are holy in Christ. So we're not becoming something that we're not. We are called saints, holy ones. Uh, and so we're, we're not <clears throat> assuming that we are somehow making ourselves holy uh, Jesus is our holiness. I mean, study Romans 4 to 8, Hebrews 8 to 10, uh, 1 Peter 1 and 2, we see our holiness in Christ. And yet Peter exhorted us, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So this is the divine process of the inner life working out in holiness. And so Archibald Alexander uh, put it like this, and stress how essential that vital piety is or holiness for all of ministry. If the time should come, which may God avert, when vital piety shall not be deemed an essential prerequisite to an entrance on the sacred office, Ichabod may be written on our church, for the glory will have departed from her. And then he explains, a holy life preaches to the consciences of men as nothing else does. And it gives weight and influence to every word which he speaks. Whereas if a minister's conduct, <clears throat> excuse me, be not exemplary, he may speak with the eloquence of men and angels, and it will be disregarded. Nothing upon earth is so lovely as the mild but steady light of a holy life. To exhibit such a life, you must become eminent in piety. So how do we pursue piety? Well, Thomas Murphy identifies four practices. One is prayer. He, he cites Andrew Fuller, who said, I wish I'd prayed more for the assistance of the Holy Spirit in studying and preaching my sermons. Uh, Jordan Stone, in his book on uh, 
uh, on McChain called a, 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 a holy minister uh, points out that McChain called prayer the Christian's noblest and most fruitful employment. Uh, secret prayer meant everything to him because that was the Savior's deepest pleasure. McChain said, uh, Christ loves secret prayer. Ah, uh, you are no Christian if you do not love secret prayer. Oh, brethren, a prayerless man is an unconverted man. It is through prayer that the soul enjoys great nearness to God, enters within the veil, and lies down at the feet of Jesus. Second, Murphy adds, is devotion. And Murphy writes, a whole morning uh, hour, a whole morning hour spent in reading the Word of God, in prayer, and in spiritual meditation, what an influence it would have been upon the life. And then he, he writes that the pastor never commences a day that will not bring him something in which he will need divine guidance. And he talks about temptation, ministering to the dying, counseling inquirers, preaching a sermon, influencing others by words, setting an example, making prog uh, progress in grace and heavenly love, standing as an intercessor. And then he probes, how can a pastor enter upon any of such solemn responsibility without making sure of divine help during every moment? McChain practiced devotion with fruitfulness. And so he wisely counseled, increase thy diligence in the means of grace. If you have truly found the Lord Jesus, be often at the spot where you have met with him. If you found him in the word, be faithful and diligent in meeting him there. If you let your Bible slip, you are be beginning to let Jesus slip. J.W. Alexander in his book, Thoughts on Preaching, uh, highlights the importance of devotion to Christ. He said, of all people on earth, ministers most need the constant impressions derived from closet piety. So these pr private devotions. To prevent such declension, the best advice I know of is to be much in secret devotion, including in this term, the reflective reading of scripture, meditation, self-examination, prayer, and praise. Then the fourth thing that Murphy mentions is Bible reading. And, and McChain had six resolutions for this study of God's Word that was this lifelong practice. One, read it regularly. Two, read it in more places than one, so vary your genre. Three, read it with parallels. Four, read whole books. Five, try to understand. Six, pray before and after. And then McChain said, go then to Jesus for all you need. Learn the means of sanctification, the Word. No holiness without the Bible. Unless you love your Bibles and feed upon them, you would never stand with the Lamb upon Mount Zion with golden harps. But we can fall into the trap of just looking for sermons. I, I remember a, a guy who was a young pastor, and, and I was a young preacher boy. I was probably 17 at the time. And I went in on a Sunday morning, uh, and he was kind of scrambling around. He said, every time I open the Bible, I'm trying to find a sermon. And I had this alarm go off in me that even though I was 17 and green as an unright gourd, I thought something's wrong here. Well, he didn't last in pastoral ministry. Lloyd-Jones put it like this. I would emphasize this more strongly. One of the most fatal habits a preacher can ever fall into is to read his Bible simply in order to find text for sermons. Do not read the Bible to find text for sermons. Read it because... It is the food that God has provided for your soul because it is the word of God, because it is the means whereby you get to know God. Read it because it is the bread of life, the manna provided for your soul's nourishment and well-being. And then the fourth thing Murphy says is preach to yourself. He writes, when the preacher delivers the message of God, he should never separate himself from his audience as if he were not addressed. He needs the communications of grace just as much as his congregation does. And then John Owen, the Puritan giant, uh, uh, wrote this. Another thing is required is the experience of the power of the things we preach to others. It is surely the case that no man preaches a sermon effectively to others who has not first preached it to his own heart. He who does not feed on and digest and grow by what he has prepared for the people may be giving them poison as far as he knows, for unless he feels the power of it in his own heart, he cannot have any confidence that it will have power in the hearts of others. It is an easier thing to prepare our heads to preach 
then to prepare our hearts to preach. Then aim at holiness and then savor Christ, something that Jordan and I were interacting on a couple of months ago. Ministry, with all of its demands, can sidetrack us from the pursuit of Christ. It is so odd, but brothers, I stand to testify that can happen over and over. We can become professionals at our work and dead in our hearts. If we would pr pursue piety, and with that, the sweetness of savoring Christ, we have to regularly examine ourselves in word and prayer. So John Owen writes, we are to pray for the presence of Christ in all our gatherings, for it is on this that all the efficacy of the ordinances of the gospel depends. We put ourselves at risk for the effectiveness of the ordinance of preaching and praying do not depend on anything in ourselves, on our gifts, thoughts, abilities, and zeal, but only on the presence of Christ. The Spirit will be our help. The Spirit will expose our sins and the attitudes of heart and bitterness and slothfulness and all those things. As I've heard it said for years, an unexamined life is not worth living. And so we need to practice that as, as a motto. But it, the, the savoring Christ is not just dealing with sin, it's savoring Him. It's being in His presence. As Paul told the Corinthians, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And in the very next verse, chapter 4, verse 1, 2 Corinthians, he speaks about this ministry given by the mercy of God. In other words, we are those serving as pastors who make it in our priority to get near the face of Christ. We long to be transformed into that image of the glory of the Lord. And that's one day going to happen in perfection. But here we're seeking to lead our people into savoring Christ, treasuring Him. We want them to taste and see that the Lord is good. But if we're not tasting and savoring Him, how can we expect our people to do so? Sometimes we lack any sense of the Lord at work in us. And yet we're called to preach and to counsel and to give wise advice and bring comfort and solve problems and settle discord. So how do we deal with that? Well, Ryland really sensed this deeply and Newton counseled him and, uh, and advised him. And he, he does it in four ways. Uh, he tells him that he's got to own his weaknesses endure suffering, wrestle with self-examination, and embrace Christ's dependence. And because of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of pop through these. One, realize your weaknesses and how the Lord is training you in ex experiencing weaknesses so that you learn how to serve the flock. He writes, how could you speak properly upon the deceitfulness of the heart if you do not feel the deceitfulness of your own soul? How could you speak pertinently of the inward warfare, the contrary principles of flesh and spirit fighting one against another if your own spiritual desires were always vigorous and successful and meet with a little opposition or control? Second thing, realize that there is a, a struggle going on and, and you are suffering in that. It leads to humility. Uh, Newton refers to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 by being exalted above measure, perhaps there may be a reference not only to his spirit, lest he should think more highly of himself than he ought, but likewise to his preaching, lest not having the same causes of complaint and humiliation in common with others, he should shoot over the heads of his hearers, confine himself chiefly to speak of such comforts and privileges as he himself enjoyed, and have little to say for the refreshment of those who were discouraged and cast down by continual conflict with indwelling sin. And then a third thing, realize that this savoring Christ is a daily pursuit. You don't rest on past laurels. Uh, Newton says, a resting in notions of gospel truth or in the recollection of past comforts without a continual thirst for fresh communications from the fountain of life is, I'm afraid, the canker which eats away the beauty and faithfulness of many professors of, of uh, the, the Christian faith and Christian gospel. He, he, he encourages him, and I think I put the quote in, I'm, I'm not sure, but he, uh, because this can put us on a guilt trip and say, well, I'm struggling. 
Because we can earnestly seek the presence of the Lord and seek to know his face and feel nothing. So what do we do? He says, but if we are conscious of the desire, if we seek it carefully in the use of all appointed means, the means, means of grace, if we willingly allow ourselves in nothing which has shown a, no, has a known tendency to grieve the Spirit of God. In other words, we're, we're dealing with sin and to damp our sense of divine things. And so in other words, we're, we're earnest. We haven't fully sensed the Lord's presence. He says, then if the Lord is pleased to keep us short of those comforts which he has taught us to prize, and instead of lively sensations of joy and praise, we feel a languor and deadness of spirit, provided we do indeed feel it and are humbled for it, we have no need to give way to despondency and excessive sorrow. So there's hope even in despair, he's saying. Still the fountain of our hope, the ground of our abiding joys is the same. And the heart may be as really alive to God and grace is truly in exercise when we walk in comparative darkness and see little light as when the frame of our spirits is more comfortable. And then practically, we seek the Lord, we examine our hearts, we look for uh, sins, and we seek its face. Uh, he, he said, uh, Newton said, sinful principles may and too often mix with and defile our best desires. He said, I've often defected two, uh, detected two vile abominations, self-will and self-righteousness, insinuating themselves into this concern. And he said, like Satan, who works by them, he can continually or can occasionally assume the appearance of an angel of light. I have felt an impatience in my spirit, utterly unsuitable to my state as a sinner and a beggar, and to my profession of yielding myself and all my concerns to the Lord's disposal. He has mercifully convinced me that I labor under a complication of disorder, summed up in the word sin. Uh, and so he, he exhorts to, uh, uh, about indwelling sin, how we suffer under, suffer under the weight of it, and that should lead us to the gospel. Humbled I ought to be to find I'm so totally depraved, but not discouraged, since Jesus is appointed to me, I'm God, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. And since I find that in the midst of this darkness and deadness, he keeps alive the principle of grace which he has implanted in my heart. Aim at holiness, savor Christ, be an example of what it means to live in Christ. Be examples to the flock. We take our example from Christ who is the good shepherd and we are to be able to say to our flock, follow me as by the grace of God in all my weakness as I'm learning to depend upon Christ and I follow after him. Booser talks about uh, how it requires a suitable and noble reputation in a necessary sense of all, along with that good example of life, which those who exercise the pastoral office are to display to the flock. And then I'll end with this quote from Baxter. Take heed unto yourselves, lest your example contradict your doctrine, and you lay stumbling blocks before the blind, that they may be the occasion of their ruin. Take heed unto yourselves, lest you deny with your lives that which you say with your tongues, and so be the greatest hinderers of the success of your own labors. One proud, surly, lordly word, one needless disagreement, one covetous action may cut the throat of many a sermon and destroy the fruit of all that you've been doing. Ah. Oh, for the spirit of the old guys to grab us every day, brothers. Amen. Well, let me pray for us. Father, will you help us in the things that we've heard that you have borne out in faithful lives of weak men over the centuries so that these weak men, as we gather in this room, seeking to be faithful, may know more of Christ. We pray that uh, you will enable us to give attention to our walks so that we might give proper attention to our flocks. Thank you for the food we'll enjoy.